Welcome back, everyone, to the afternoon session of the NASA iTech Forum. Before we show the presentations from our remaining finalists, we'll be hearing from our keynote speaker, Cheryl Foyle. Cheryl is a venture capitalist that focuses on real estate, logistics, and construction technology. Prior to moving into VC and private equity, Cheryl served as the chief technology officer at several companies focused on natural language processing and social media automation. In addition to her venture endeavors, she currently owns and operates six wine brands, including the Elise Winery in Napa Valley as the chief technology officer. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Cheryl. Thank you, Max. All right, so thank you everyone and especially thank you, Robin. So as far as my novice understanding of time and space goes, we're all actively living through 2020. And I wanted to talk about the important relationship between economies and entrepreneurship. Focusing especially on how companies like yours help our economy survive against anything that's thrown at it. Next. I already had a great intro, so I'll try to make this a little bit shorter, but you know, I started off as your everyday software engineer. I've been CTO of multiple natural language processing startups, focusing particularly on social media and social media text. I have pioneered several techniques in how you understand how networks of people communicate on social media, including sentiment towards brands and bots, phrase similarity, and processing stuff like typos, web speak, uh, cadence, and maybe most uniquely, how networks of chatbots can interact with a single person in a positive way. The majority of my clients were large entertainment companies like Warner Brothers, HarperCollins, and NBC, and the culmination of this work was a couple Emmy nominations, the first ever given for an AI system. And what I can put on my tombstone one day is that thanks to a very large contract with MTV, I'm probably the world's expert on making teenage werewolf chatbots. Long story. I moved on from there into venture capital in partnership with some amazing family offices. My focus over the years has been on logistics, construction, and real estate technology, many of which have some overlap in the space system of technology. I also own and operate a winery in Napa Valley, and the only thing I'm going to say about that is that wine technology is really, really bad. Small TAM, too much XML, just don't touch it. And I have never, ever trained for an Ironman, but I have won the World of Warcraft baking contest two times. Next. So 2020, despite every social media outlet conceivable, we're still not really talking about how 2020 affects startups with brutal honesty. This is my sad slide. First of all, you're a flea on a dog's back when it comes to supply. If you have any physical goods in your business at all, you may already be facing uh, very concerning supply chain shortages. For example, in wine, I've seen a shortage of aluminum cans and even CO2 for dry ice. And science aside, it's pretty funny that there's a CO2 shortage uh, given the whole climate change thing. Most pernicious, and I think right now least talked about, there are major problems in banking, especially credit. Credit committees at banks are a total mess. Banks don't know what to do. And you know, legislating regulatory changes for this is extremely complicated. And I'm not just talking about home or commercial mortgages. There have, I have already heard from many companies having issues with their credit line and credit level, even when credit lines are personally guaranteed and have collateral. I mean, even myself with a business that's doubled over last year's revenue, I've never been through so much meaningless financial reporting. It's a complete drain on all of us, anyone that's having to work with a bank in any way. The problem you've probably faced the most right now as a startup is private equity funding. Uh, you've probably dealt with investors trying to do bridge loans or attempting to get more leverage for your dollar, or you've just been playing having to write more investor management than you ever have before. Once again, it's a total energy drain and it's not strategic to your company. And meanwhile, the stock market is incredibly volatile and it's a drain to have to check the news just to find out that somebody tweeted something that made the market dip. Sales, especially long-term contracts, you know, B2B stuff, they're all dragging on as people value their dollar. That means the mechanism of how you sell is probably totally, totally changed. And all of this contributes to a psychological state known as learned helplessness. Essentially, our brains aren't great at staying happy when you feel like you're constantly being punished outside of your control. So I'm here to give you a pep talk on why it's worth it. Next. Being an entrepreneur is more than the selfish desire to have your own company and make a product come to life. 
By existing in our ecosystem and by constantly quickly evolving, you contribute to a very important concept called economic resilience. In other words, you can see that all the stress you're putting through can be represented as a civic duty. Next. My driest slide, what is economic resilience? You know, it's just the ability for an economy to recover from shock, withstand a shock or avoid a shock altogether. And withstanding shock, by the way, is just a great way to describe everything about existing in 2020. An economy that is elastic and recovers quickly is important in of itself. And I wanna quantify now that there's a different, this is a different goal than distribution of wealth or quality of life. When I talk about economic resilience, it's largely in reference to the to companies and people's willingness to continue to spend money. It's not the same as who is making that money. Next. So let's start with everybody's second favorite year, 2008, and the recession that began in 2007 to 2009. There are many household names on this slide that were just fledgling companies or had not yet hit their inflection point that were part of large trends. The earliest trend was price sensitive entertainment. Netflix started streaming in 2007. That was also the year that Hulu was founded. Under $10 a month for streaming created a completely different product and price category than cable, and it also added a completely different set of customers on top of it. On the wings of that, retail totally changed. Amazon had massive retail acceleration post financial crisis, and they started to hit their hockey stick growth. There's your canned venture capital term for you of uh, this presentation. And all those daily deal sites sprung up, you know, most notably Groupon, but they're probably all still spamming your email right now. Thanks, 2008. The internet was finally ready for aggregation of products and price searching, and consumers were finally able to learn more about relative quality of the items at the same time. This kept spending up. Next up, the most controversial of them all, the gig economy, or as I like to call it, perceived financial independence. 2008 brought on tons of marketplace and gig work. This was very much because of the recession, and this has been an incredible influence on our population and lives at large. 40% of American workers currently participate in the gig economy. As the economy started to recover, payment startups emerged. From Venmo, you know, which helped everybody fairly split tabs and then became a bigger thing, to companies that rapidly modernized payments for small businesses like Stripe and Square. And of course, the final trend as the economy recovered was related to capital and funding. Angelist's radical take on private equity emerged. Uh, companies like Fundrise boldly stated that real estate investing shouldn't just be for the 0.1%. And of course, there's GoFundMe, which is kind of a Venmo on steroids. And while it would be unfair to say that these companies were only successful due to 2008, the fact that many of them still struggle with unit economics suggests there are strong currents that accelerated them besides just metric tons of venture capital. Next. Okay. Here's my slide acknowledging that while companies like this help the economy recover and grow, there are huge systemic issues that have emerged, and some of them are very much because of these companies. So we're going to have a little, you know, psychological palate cleanser. A couple objectively good things have happened since then. First of all is, you know, consumer privacy being something that mattered. It feels like everything is less private than ever, but many technology enhancing privacy companies started up during the recession. Many technologies, stuff like browsers like DuckDuckGo, uh, cryptocurrency, and you could still argue that Apple heavily swung, you know, and started to hang its marketing hat on uh, privacy as being a core part of their products. It was even in the, you know, the products that they launched this week. Secondly, and I'm going to take you back down to the darkest part of memory lane right now. The Facebook open graph was that technology that let you see every single time your great aunt Miriam played Candy Crush or Farmville on Facebook. Feeds were incredibly spammy. Just imagine if we had to go through 2020 still knowing what everybody was actually doing online. That would be worse. Finally, and closest to my heart, and represented by my emotional baggage, XML, and the fact that XML usage is still going down every year, technology is better. Your company is probably relying on something new, from smartphones to remote servers, sensors, AI libraries. It's a totally different world. And in the early stages of a startup, developer productivity has never been better, and that's better for your odds. I mean, I remember back in 2010 at like a small startup, one of my ops guys got stuck in a data center overnight and he had to sleep on the cold hard floor until like the security people came back in the morning. 
that's not even really a thing we have to fear anymore, you know, for most small companies. That's solved. Next. So let's finally move on to 2020. COVID-19, the shutdowns, hopefully the death of bankers boxes and filing cabinets because we don't even have offices anymore. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the way that big technologies and new ones are helping us recover from 2020. Next. Startups and companies previously known as startups have scale in their company DNA. You're probably already familiar with all these companies, but just think for a quick moment about how much they scaled to meet new immediate need over just a handful of months due to the COVID shutdown. From being able to schedule remote therapy through Talkspace to food and good, food and good stuff like Grubhub and Amazon, video calling technology, exercise at home, you know, healthcare related companies that are actually independent of uh, insurance, you know, Warby Parker was kind of first to market there remote education of our kids or stuff like DocuSign, you know, just the ability to sign a document remotely in a legally binding way, which by the way, banks still don't do. I hate banks. These companies and many more in their sectors mobilized. And there's no doubt that they have assisted with immediate stability um, in 2020. Next. And so the common thread, if you look back through all of those companies is logistics and I'm not talking about trucking or cargo ships. Fundamentally, point A to point B is not the same thing that it used to be. So this slide has my only indulgent nerd joke. The traveling salesman problem, for those of you that remember their computer science degree, is the problem of how a salesman can visit every city once and exactly once. And that feels even harder when you think about COVID exposure. And it's pretty funny that MP hard is harder. Ha ha, thank you for tolerating that. But back to you and your company, and to my only piece of advice in this entire deck. Logistics has changed, and your company is now a logistics company, at least in some small way. There's a very real chance that over the next few years, your superior product could lose out to a different company that better solved the logistics part of being in your market. Whether that's adjusting to sales, networking that's not in person, product delivery, or even just how your company is managed in a remote world, you cannot put your head in the sand. Next. So while it's hard to relate to the mega companies that I've talked about, uh, economic resilience, you know, the willingness for companies and people to keep working and spending has an emotional, irrational component. Advancements that we're making in other areas, whether it's health and wellness, like the ability to book therapy at home, home dialysis, get a psychiatric prescription without insurance, give us hope. The belief that identity verification might be solved or even applied to voting is a hope we all have. We need accessible, affordable education from anywhere, and any parent can tell you there's still some innovation needed. They're hoping and praying every day. And on parents, just finally being able to feel like your kids can have a safe time playing online matters ever now that they're stuck at home. These things are all important, and sometimes it's not about what's happening, but it's about what will happen next, and you're a part of it. The progress you're making is inspiring and it gets us all out of bed in the morning. Next. And maybe you're a really small company and you haven't you know, been caught up by anything I've said yet. You know, Maybe you've got like two people and a dog on your payroll. You don't have a customer yet. I've been there. You're nimble and that comes with power and responsibility. Unlike bigger companies, you have the ability to lead just by making decisions. You can choose to advocate for work-life balance, you can keep your employees safe with a permanent work from home policy. And these kinds of things help address bigger issues like diversity. And it's worth noting that diversity includes disability hiring. And with all the remote tools available, you have it in you to create a company that truly has the best people possible in it. And it doesn't take a venture capitalist to tell you the earlier you make a change in your company, the easier it is to do and live through. Next. So speaking of great opportunities ahead and closing, I assume that you're here because you know the support the government can give your company is far beyond just policy and stimulus. So I'm delighted to end with some success stories from government innovation programs. Via the NASA iTech program, Daimler's Germ Falcon is collaborating on a disinfecting robot for the ISS. X Analytical Space through the uh, Air Force program AFWorks has received over $30 million in the combination of funding and government contracts. And I'll note, I've learned today that several iTech companies have also worked with AFWorks. 
Lastly, and back to ITEC, ACORT recently performed anti-biofilm research in partnership with the Marshall Space Flight Center. These innovation programs provide real value. It's not just another award to put on LinkedIn. And these are opportunities you can't get anywhere else. Thank you so much for being a believer in everything that ITEC does and joining us today. It's time to wrap up, so I'm going to leave you with one final moment of inspiration. Next. All of us, even the DMV, are innovating in new exciting ways thanks to 2020. You can actually do some stuff online now there. And you could say that COVID-19 has become everyone's aggressive, effective chief technology officer. It's pushing us forward. And you know, if the DMV can make it happen, so can you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Cheryl. And Max, back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Cheryl. I mean, that's, uh, I, I love those themes, uh, innovating through necessity, uh, taking some, um, all of our uh, hardship and turning it into opportunity to advance and just uh, putting things in, 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 in a respect, uh, perspective of progress. I, I really appreciate that talk. Um, now, uh, we're going to transition back into our, our, our regular programming. I would like to uh, invite uh, Rohit uh, with uh, AI Technologies and Systems to uh, start the uh, presentation and Q&A. Rohit, Hi, I'm Rohit, founder of AITS. We are at a mission to bring AI to every edge device in the world to create magical gadgets. So what are IoT and Edge devices? They are typically a microcontroller like the one you see in my hand or the one inside this thermostat. They are low energy, low latency, low power, and they're everywhere. And they are very inexpensive, typically under $10. There are over 300 billion microcontrollers in the world today that can be converted into smart IoT and Edge devices. AI is the new electricity that is disrupting many verticals and markets, with magical applications quietly sneaking into our daily lives. For example, autonomous vehicles that can pick up your groceries or self-navigating rovers with reduced dependence on earth control centers for command to get unstuck. Or medical retinopathy that can diagnose high-risk cardiovascular patients just by analyzing eyes orbital radiography. Another simple AI application that can diagnose the health of thousands of integrated assets in space machinery to avoid expensive downtimes. Take a second to reflect how many microcontrollers are around you. In a typical household, they are in every appliance, including your toaster, your fridge, your TV, your microwave, your DSLR, and even your doorbell. These large complex AI models require powerful servers in large data centers. Bringing them to small tiny devices like microcontrollers has been unthinkable. We are doing exactly that. Bringing complex AI models to the world of $10 devices running on battery for months. And by doing that, we are putting power of AI in the hands of a common man. Imagine 70 million mute population world over finding their voice with wearable glove speaker that can convert sign language to spoken words and sentences. Our technology enables that. Or imagine a poor farmer using $50 AI enabled device to identify problem areas and potential improvements to increase his yield and income. Our technology enables that. Our technology also enables measurement of altitude in nanosatellites using Earth images from a commercial off-the-shelf camera providing swap, meaning size, weight and power advantages over traditional method. A simple three-layer convolution neural network running on a 60 MHz CPU with a fraction of 1 watt can provide accuracy of up to 98%. Other applications of AI include detecting seizures a minute before the onset so that the patient can find safety before losing control of her body, and 
robot assisted surgery that can save lives by recognizing foreign objects with more precision, flexibility and control. Our technology brings magical devices like these to life by miniaturizing AI models to run on tiny devices. There are several thousand use cases like this and more that are coming each day with ML research producing over 100,000 papers every year. Why aren't more people and companies putting AI into miniaturized and mobile gadgets? There are several reasons. Challenging miniaturization of models, poor hardware support, non-existing software infrastructure, deep tech skill set required, and ever-evolving AI models. Our solution, Canvas, is designed to address pain points in these steps by automating and simplifying the process. It lets user capture data straight from the sensors using browser-based applications. It allows cleansing, training, and validation of models using Python notebooks. And once trained, model can be enhanced and developed into an app using C++ notebooks and compiled to an IoT device of user's choice. It also has a facility to flash the model with a push button. Our solution is as simple as connecting devices to a laptop and have Canvas flash AI model straight to the device. Our platform offers no-code, low-code and full-code approaches to deploy AI models. These models and applications are brought from open source or developed by a third party. Here is a brief demo of our platform. Once logged in, you can always browse the gallery of pre-compiled applications. It lets you download and flash straight to your hardware device. No code needed. For customization of application, our platform offers capture, upload and retraining of the models with minor code changes. Low code approach. And for advanced applications, platform provides complete control of Python and C++ notebooks with full code guiding principle. Canvas even allows developers to build their own datasets on the platform through uploading files. Developers can create their own datasets for AI applications using sensors from their own devices such as microphone and cameras. Canvas platform thus provides a comprehensive end-to-end -end solution enabling developers to do all beginning from the training their AI model to compiling it onto their tiny devices. Our deep tech core technology includes compiler, library, and a platform, and it differentiates us from our competition. We conducted a couple of case studies to find the efficacy of our platform, and we found that usage of our platform saves anywhere from three to six man weeks of effort. Our indirect competition includes large companies like Google and Arm and startups alike. None of our competitive landscape has shown holistic approach to the solution to provide the entire solution. We are the first one with a solution to convert a dumb piece of hardware into a smart one. Moreover, our deep tech compiler solution has no match so far. Our complete solution approach with ecosystem support is expected to flood the applications on the platform creating a win-win situation for everyone from MC vendors to end consumer. We are early to solve many of these pain points, including AI apps running on devices without internet connectivity. We are early to market with first compiler for MCUs with memory and CPU trade-off. We aggressively optimize for underlying hardware and we are also adaptable for newer neural networks and hardware accelerators. And we have a complete support, we are ahead of competition and we mean cost saving. That means short time to market, less resources and cost and improved productivity. Our compiler DeepC has support for over 100 layers, whereas the only other alternate option TF Flight Micro has 53 layers to date. We are better on peak RAM consumption compared to the alternate solution, and we are as good or better on CPU time compared to the competition. Moreover, our technology produces smaller code for low power applications with better performance for a given edge device. 
With this technology, we enable hundreds of verticals and markets. So the question is, how big can you dream with this enablement that will disrupt countless industries and verticals, including smart homes, smart cities, smart infrastructure, and many more. So what's the urgency? There are several technical and socio-economic factors. For example, NLP models have memory footprint small enough to be executed in the edge device itself. And for biometric sensors, privacy is of supreme importance. For example, fingerprint sensor has about 125 points once compromised or stolen over the network are irreplaceable, unlike passwords, and must be processed on the edge device itself. We are working with leaders like ARM and Qualcomm, and we are also piloting with MCU vendors and MCU leaders. Our achievements have been notable so far, ranging from winning competition, publishing papers, getting selected in accelerators, and so on. Our products can bring huge body of AI research and applications to small, wearable, mountable, and remote devices running on battery. Our technology has a broad value base in countless markets and verticals. US TAM for our products is about 9 billion. Business model is B2B and B2C with subscription based on time-based licensing model. And this is our team. I have worked on graph products like these many times in design automation in companies including TI, Ansys, Apache, Synopsys, and Cadence. And in the last company I started, we brought application of ML to EDA working with large companies like NVIDIA. AITS co-founder Praveen Jain and I grew up together and coming together again to take over the AIoT world. Praveen is a graduate of UIUC with over 20 years working in Intel and AMD to bring multiple ML products to market. We have a skill set of developers and stellar set of advisors and mentors including Marion Smith and Dave Lambert. We have convertible note and working with RS Capital to raise our next funding round, we are seeking guidance and connections to widen adoption of AI into NASA technologies with our product. AI is already running on the edge. NASA does or will require low power AI models in the bulk in future on the edge devices. NASA has a need for the products and the technology we are developing. We are looking for connections, guidance and early adopters within NASA and beyond. Thank you. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. Let's open up questions. Harry? Oh, very nice. Uh, can you say something about who your competitors are again? A uh, little bit. Yeah, so our competitors are large including Google um, and uh, ARM. Um, but the differentiation we bring to the problem is a holistic approach of bringing large AI models uh, from end to end. For example, Google is solving a, a runtime problem. Um, they are offering a runtime library. ARM is supplying the library for these layers. Um, and it is still up to the end user to stitch these things together in eight different complex steps. Now, we are taking this entire approach from ground up with the library, compiler, framework, and the platform. And with that, we enable somebody who does not have time or skills to code just by connecting a microcontroller like this and make it smart. And so that's the holistic approach which no, no, no other company has the competition of. And so what is your first product? Is there an area that you're going after? Right, so the first product we have is a compiler in the library, and our long-term strategic um, view is to go after these MCU vendors with customer base of um, six digits. Um, typically, if you see these uh, vendors are generally, you know, the 95% the of the market is uh, split between 50 um, MCU vendors. Uh, and each one of them, the top 10 have customers ranging uh, in the in the digits of uh, you know several hundred thousands. So we are going after the strategic partnership with these MCU vendors with our time-based licensing of compiler and library, and that integrate that into their SDK, which in turn they will offer to their users. And once users become um, um, habitual of using our product, 
that will bring them to our platform. So our first product is compiler and library, and our platform is for the end consumer, which uh, is for 25 million developers on, on planet Earth. Thank you. All right, Can you John? talk a bit about your, uh, your IP holdings and or patents and um, what you know, the neighboring uh, competition is in this area? Right. So we are the only company working on the compiler and a library for low power domain. We have over 10 techniques that are ready to be filed today. We are waiting for funding. And let me repeat again, we are working in the low power domain. The software we produce is low power, low code, works in our resource constraint devices. Now, the closest competition we have is Google, which is, we are, we are ahead of that at the moment from them. And again, they are not focusing on low power. We take a holistic approach of combining the devices, the application and the board, all three together. And when you look at this whole vertical, there are whole host of engineering algorithms that we have devised that give us that advantage. So in the short run, we will keep the technology advantage, file the patents. In the long run, we hope to build the ecosystem for developers and in multi-million user base to create these applications that will flood the market. Thank you. John. Yeah, thanks. Great, great work, great technology. I just wanted to confirm that your compiler and library can currently run on state-of-the-art hardware. Or does it need your own proprietary hardware? No. So we are hardware agnostic. We run on, uh, you know, ARM, um, ARM M series, which is typically 70% of the market share. We also run on PowerPC and some of the CISC microcontrollers. Um, we are completely ground up and hardware agnostic. It's a software solution that runs on every microcontroller. All right, any other questions? Can you talk a bit about your price point on this and what it looks like for licensing for like projects or organizations? Um, sure, so um, I would skip the number part. Maybe we can take it in the closed session, um, but our long-term strategy, I mean, short-term strategy is to go after MCU vendors which have uh, several hundred thousand users. Once we embed our software with them, which is a short market, there are only 50 of or so vendors. The, the revenue is not huge compared to the larger market, but they enable our larger market. And we get that by embedding our software and get it to the end consumer. Once that floodgate opens after you know, 18 months or so, we would have uh, millions of developers on our platform developing, you know, smart applications and adopting AI research in in a day or in in a as little time as a, as a day or two. So to come back to your answer, the short term focus is MCU vendors, which is a smaller part of the pie, and we are currently focused only in three verticals: um, IIoT, smart home and smart health. And they, these three verticals are currently growing despite COVID, um, according to several reports. But eventually we, we hope, we actually plan to um, open our platform to the end consumer, uh, which are currently 25 million developers. Thank you. Praveen, do you have anything else to add? I think you covered well, Roy. Yeah. All right, Cheryl. So the verticals you listed are very, very large. Is there any particular problem, you know, where a certain subsection of them is having a lot of pain and they urgently need your technology that will be your beachhead? So that would eventually come from our MC vendors, right? They have this larger purview of over quarter million customers per MC vendor. We don't have that visibility. They do. So currently we are working with them one vertical at a time not there yet to answer your question, but eventually our platform will have that visibility once we have covered multiple of these MCU vendors and have millions of those developers on our platform. We would be the first one to see where the pain point is, which vertical is taking off, and what applications will come 
in, in the next month or quarter. Thank you. Hey, in, in your opinion, from what you've seen, uh, um, maybe just your own ideas or from people, customers you've talked to, what's the most exciting application uh, of this? What do you think is the most exciting? Oh, the applications, so they excite me every day. My personal favorite so far is uh, a mute speaker uh, for mute population, which is 70 million worldwide. Um, and the application that we work uh, with partnership with a large company uh, converts the sign gesture. So mute people, they don't speak, they, they, they sign to each other. So this is hi, this is how are you? Um, and if a mute person were to come to me or you, we don't know, we likely don't know the, the sign language and we cannot hold a conversation. And so what we provide, what our technology will provide is an application that can go on a wearable speaker uh, wearing on the back of your wrist with a speaker. And when they are doing signing, that speaker with the help of gyroscope and accelerometer can decode that sign and with NLP combined can guess and convert that to sentences and spoken words. Now with that, we can unlock the joyous conversation of 70 million mute population worldwide. Yeah. That thing excites me and there are several applications in the smart health that we are yet to discover. Applications are just a matter of imagination. AI is coming. The minute you start thinking about it, three to six months down the line, you have a research that proves it, and it's a, it's a, it's another six to eighteen months where POC and the company gets funded, and you have something that changes the world forever. Yeah, yeah, great application, good, good answer. Thank you. All right, Sherman. Yes. So you don't have visibility into the end users in the beginning due to selling your product through the MCU vendor. What is your strategy to get that feedback from that end user so you can refine your product? You know, early on in product development process, that, that refinement and, and rapid refinement of the product is extremely important. So how do you plan on tackling that considering, considering you said yourself, you won't have clear sight um, to the end user? So when I said we don't have clear sight, I meant statistically, like we don't see 250,000 users coming to our site and seeing 40,000 of those are focused in IIoT. We don't have that side. But we are still working with end consumers, companies like NanoPrecise and IIoT. How do they use the product? How do they um, convert that? And how do they reach to their end customer? We are still working on those edge startups. They are not statistically significant by any means but that doesn't stop us from working with them. There are, there are a bunch of applications that are hosted on our, on our websites, working with you know, some of these vendors and coming from you know, open source models. So we have been working to refine our product, but at the same time, um, given 25 million developers, you have to have a statistic, statistically significant measure as to where the world is going. We don't have that. Our short-term customer, which is our strategic decision, have 200 or 200,000 or more customers. They see where things are going based on the requests they are seeing. So we are working with them, convincing them that the, the, the software stack we have is better than anybody else in the world. And once it is integrated and given to the end consumer, we will have those end consumer on our platform. And at that time, I would be glad to answer your question. Um, but so this is a strategic decision to go after a smaller market to get to a larger market because a startup has its, its, its means that it needs to live with. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Praveen, you have anything else to add? I was just going to add that, you know, Sherman, we, we have a very pre preliminary platform where uh, we we have about you know um, thousand developers who are you know there, but the data or the clarity that you're looking for doesn't come from thousand developers, right? Like you need a like Rohit was mentioning a much bigger sample size before we can you know um, uh, get direction out of that data. So we encourage you to uh, log on to tinyml.studio. Um, that's the URL. 
um, and explore that platform for yourself. And we've recently launched this a few weeks ago and getting 1,000 within a matter of weeks, I think is a sizable number given you know total number of developers are limited in the world. And we hope to grow that number in coming months. All right, Paul, you had a question? Yeah, Rohit, very nice job. Can you please describe for us your strategy about how you're forming relationships with the organizations in all the vertical markets, and then how you're managing to implement that strategy? Right, so um, we are in the ecosystems of these different companies, right? So AI is uh, uh, an ecosystem, Edge is evolving. And so there are these companies like NVIDIA, ARM, Microsoft, um, AWS, all of these coming together, creating place um, uh, for a company like our size with the technology that can you know, affect uh, their, their marketplaces as well. So we're working on, on their ecosystem as well as growing ours. So this is on the partnership side. On the sales side, we are working with MCU vendors to acquire their customers onto our platform as well as sell them our software because it does provide low power code that nobody else does. And lastly, again, bring those millions of developers onto, onto our, uh, our platform to, to build this entire ecosystem. All right, Cheryl, you had a yes. question? Yeah, so like, like with any question about edge devices, could you talk a little bit more about security and reliability when it comes to you know, pretty much everything you're doing with the processing on these devices? Right, so security and reliability problems are addressed in the board and we work with MCU vendors according to the strategy they have. And so far what we have heard based on talking to top five vendors, all of them have consistently said, security is a nice thing, but nobody's ready to pay. Again, not our problem. We are in the application layer um, and underlying hardware has a security, we use it. If it doesn't, we don't. Um, not our forte, not our value proposition or differentiation for that matter. It comes from our users and board providers. But what about your own software stability if, let's say, the edge network is constantly coming on and offline and I had edge lighting switches one time and it was really terrible. Right. So um, we work on disconnected edge. You don't have to be connected on the edge. It's on device AI. Right okay. now, we port just the model part of it. Application building, if it's complex one, is still our customer's responsibility. So, I mean, we would help them as and when it comes along, but this is not what we are solving. What we are solving is bringing out these large, complex AI models to miniaturize devices like these, um, and and that's that's what we are doing. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, well, Max, back to you. Thank you, uh, AI Technologies and Systems. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting a chance to talk to you in the impact tables, uh, get into a little more depth as to, to where you see the NASA fit on this. So uh, I am uh, ho hope to get in touch with you tomorrow. Uh, right now, we are right now. We're going to move on to uh, Stofel uh, Airspace. Or I'm Brian Stofel with Stofel Airspace. Thank you. Then it hit me: if Stofel Aerospace is successful, if they can properly secure their intellectual property, this simple, scalable system has the potential to totally disrupt the small launch vehicle industry. Things will never be the same. Can anyone say paradigm shift? I think everybody likes adventure. Hey, I'm Brian Stofield of Stofield Aerospace. Positive structural molding is the process by which we take a 3D printed PLA plastic PLA plastic is a biorenewable cornstarch product 
and turn it into a complex ceramic. This composite ceramic has the function and capabilities beyond the traditional brittle ceramics. We add plasticity to the ceramic, giving a little bit of flexibility. This means you can take our ballistic plate and throw it across the room without breaking it. You can take our heat shields for the motorcycles and drop the motorcycle on it. Or you can use it for the ram air system and get all that debris and rocks that get into it. We don't have that brittleness that you see with other ceramics. Positive structural molding opens the door to rapid prototyping of parts and design solutions that weren't available before. Rapid prototyping allows you to do various iterations in quick succession. For example, here at Stofield Aerospace, we were able to test a rocket, do the math, and have a new rocket 24 hours later to test again. This rapid prototyping will change the way manufacturers and customers interact. No more do you need mass production. Everything can be customized to the customer's needs. Imagine walking into a car dealership and there are no cars there, there are just chassis, just the frame and the engine. And you go over to the computer, design your car, and within 24 hours, the body of the car is 3D printed out of ceramics. This ceramic process makes the car lighter, safer, and allows you to design in safety features and wiring inside the car. We have been prototyping for the Firebird and the motorcycles and have produced intake manifolds, new mufflers, exhaust pipes, audio panels, fairings, and a ram air system. Bikers are explorers. They're the do-it-yourselfers, the early adopters. They maintain their own bikes and usually will build their own bikes. We took our technology and space flight to Sturgis, South Dakota to the largest motorcycle rally in the world. 500,000 bikes were there. You're talking about a $75,000 truck towing a $250,000 RV with $75,000 worth of bikes on the back. And we had just demonstrated our technology to a enthusiastic crowd. A crowd that understood the problem of hot exhaust pipes burn and destroy uh, gear. The other wide vertical we are focused on right now is armor. Let me set the stage. A couple of years back, a research came out that showed even pieces of plastic could defeat a ballistic projectile when they're arranged in a fractal pattern. We've taken that one step further and applied positive structural molding to create a latticey armor that offers capabilities beyond the traditional ceramic plate. These plates. plates are not brittle like traditional ceramics. You can take my plate and throw it across the room and it won't crack or degrade its abilities. No spalling from the ballistic plate. The links actually break apart and reinforce each other. We don't see the ceramic turning to dust. Easily integrated into existing fabrics. We've shown this through the leather jacket. We have chainmail ceramics inside a leather jacket for crash protection and ballistic protection. Basically a level one leather jacket. And custom PPE. We can customize crash helmets. We can make face masks even sporting equipment and personal injury. You've got a splint, you need a prosthetic hand. This can all be made out of ceramics now. But these aren't just ballistic plates. These are next generation armor and they protect against directed energy weapons such as microwave and laser. At 20 minutes. So I've been interested in space since I was a little kid. I got a picture sent in the mail of the first space shuttle launch out of Kennedy Space Center and that really hit me. It hung in my bedroom since I was a kid and then it was just a matter of watching that space program grow. I went to space camp both 6th and 7th grade and started flying an airplane at about 10 years old. Building a small satellite based on an MRI principle, I ran into the actual bottleneck in the launch industry, which is four to seven years to get on a rocket. So a lot of the CubeSats are secondary payloads, and they have to wait and they get bumped off of rockets. And I approached my five-year-old daughter and I said, look, uh, it's gonna take us about four years to get into space and about $2 million. And my little five-year-old daughter, Belladonna, looks at me and goes, well, sounds like we have to actually build a rocket now. 
So we started building Stofield Aerospace and the Borea system. We're going after those industries that did not enter in the 80s. The pharmaceuticals, the biomed, the materials development. These are customers whose R&D development is large, lightweight, cheap, and scalable to the payload. Everybody gets a dedicated launch system, the right payload, the right rocket, to the right orbit for the mission. Using our intellectual property ecosystem, we are able to design based upon customer needs. And that includes the rocket Boreas. Boreas has no infrastructure required for launch, can be launched by a four-person team, is scalable to a single payload, and drops costs significantly. Boreas uses three parts to accomplish an efficient and inexpensive way to orbit. The first part, the balloon. Helium or hydrogen, we can carry the whole system up to 100,000 feet where the atmospheric pressure is one-tenth of what it is on the ground. This allows us to use up to 70% less fuel than a ground-based rocket. The Hermes rocket is unique in many ways. Solid rocket only, we use no liquid propellants. Made of composite ceramics, there is no metal in the structure of our rocket. This means that the rocket is scalable to the payload and mission and can be stored up to 10 years in stable condition. This allows for on-demand launches to your orbit with the right rocket, or as we say, the right payload, the right rocket, the right orbit, the right mission. Hyperion is the last part of the Boreas launch system. As a drop drone, Hyperion contains all of the equipment that did not need to be on the rocket the non-GPS location system, the batteries for primary ignition. At 100,000 feet, Hyperion takes its location, develops a firing solution using the Zeus computer, and uploads that to Her Hermes. At primary ignition, Hyperion drops off and monitors command and control for the rocket, after which it returns home and can be reused. To date, we've done 38 static fire tests, four hover tests in the candlestick position, and two balloon flights. The 38 static fire tests were broken up into the Mark I, which just to prove we could use thermal plastics for testing, the Mark II, which explored the, the new novel fluid dynamics inside the rocket that allow us to thrust, throttle, and vector a solid rocket, and the Mark III was there to basically ferment and uh, solidify my PhD as flow dynamics inside this rocket. The Mark IV tests are all about power and efficiency. The four hover tests showed us the stability and control that the novel fluid dynamics have on the rocket thrust systems. And the two balloon flights just showed us how to fly a balloon. And actually, we've done three. The third one was an eclipse balloon during the last solar eclipse. He's doing something that has never been done before. And, and that, that is a common bond with us. It's the kind of thing the engineers, engineers think of. It's a novel way to do something that needs to be done. It, it's just such a novel idea. I, I really admire Next, it. Let's summarize first. We've secured our IP, we've established a bunch of prototypes in two different verticals, and we have a new rocket printed out of plastic. So this is a good time to introduce the purpose of the Firebird. In the most basic form, the Firebird is a Hyperion development. From a dropship below Boreas to a small satellite deployer, Hyperion grows up with the spaceflight program to become a crewed Earth planetary system vehicle that allows lock and load propulsion. Explorers built in situation all the time, and that's what we're going to need to do in space. There's already printers on the space station. People are already talking about 3D printing habitats on the moon. Positive structural molding and 3D printed ceramics gives you one more tool in that toolkit as an explorer.
You needed a canoe, you built a canoe. That's what we're going to have to do in space. Immortality is out there. The first here, the first there. All you have to do is grab it. Everybody says that there's no exploration left in the world. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of exploration to be done. But it means fabricating. It doesn't mean what can you buy. It means what can you build. And there is a severe lack of that. We can build things. We know how to fabricate things. We're generalists. We can build a lot of different things. And that is where space flight needs to be. Is we need to be building things now. There are great designs. You can spend a lot of money on a great design and never get a benefit out of it. Every time you build something, you learn something. Every time you build something, you try something, you stretch your limits. And that's where that explorer economy really comes from. We're going to commoditize the explorer economy in the long run. We're going to turn every trip between here and the moon, between here and Sirius, between here and Mars, will make X amount of money for that trip. And we know that, that that trip always makes this amount of money. And then we move up in stage. And then we move up in stage and say, okay, now we found something new. We're bringing it back. That's icing on that cake. But every time we make an explorational trip out as human beings, we understand that we're going to make X amount of dollars in either resources, knowledge, or technology. And that is the way to grow a sustainable space flight. Involve the mass public, sell the mass public the most advanced technology that they can handle, and then commoditize the explorer economy, commoditize going out there and picking things up. Don't just bring back moon rocks, we're gonna be bringing back helium three. Don't bring, just bring back dust and regolith, we're gonna bring back neodymium and rare earth elements. The gear, for example, that needs to operate in a high temp environment and your next supply is six to eight months away, you're gonna to have to adapt to that. And positive structural molding allows us to adapt to the situation, not just in situation. Bottom line is, we wanna sell you something. Positive structural molding can make your dreams come true. Our rocket can give you instant access to space. Hyperion can take you to the moon. But th what this really is, is sustainable space flight, and we build things. We build hardware. Spaceflight has had a problem. They don't need another design. They don't need another blueprint. They don't need another way. They need space accessible hardware and a lot of it. And we're building that hardware. We're using ground technology to test it out so that we understand our hardware explicitly before we take it to space. Space is not hard. We understand how to do it. Space is complex, and that complexity increases the difficulty, of course. But we can do it. We understand it. When McDonnell Douglas began this with Mercury and Gemini, they didn't even know how to do space flight. They understood some things, but there was a lot of unknowns. And we're at that same point. We understand space flight. We don't understand exploration. We don't understand how to adapt to the situations we actually see in front of us because we don't have enough hardware. We don't have on-demand access to space flight. We are not sending regular people up there, welders and HVAC guys and plumbers and carpenters. These are people of trades that we're gonna need in space and that's when you're gonna see the regular space flight. At Stofield Aerospace, we're not trying to sell you a ride to space. We're trying to sell you a rocket. We're not trying to sell you one on an idea. We're trying to sell you a product. We want your money. We want you to support us, not as investors, but as customers. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and open up questions. Harry, did you have one? Yeah, very nice. Um, can you give an estimate of what it would cost uh, to build a rocket and how long it would take you to build one? 
Uh, right now, all our standards are set to Bella standards, which means Bella Donna is our 14 year old. And she can build out our hypersonic version in about 89 hours by herself. Um, the average cost of the rocket is right around the $10,000 a kilogram. So we can scale the rocket. We're not a, a max lift system. And we actually scale the rocket to the payload. Uh, so we build the size of a rocket. The rocket cost goes up as, the, as it gets bigger, right? Uh, and that's pretty linear. Uh, so we're able to offer between 15 kilograms and 250 kilograms dedicated launches on their own rocket systems. Can you talk a bit about your control system and what you're doing for like uh, flight termination in case uh, needed a board or other things like this, please? So the rocket uses a, a proprietary novel fluid dynamics to be able to thrust throttle and vector the solid rocket engine. Mm -hmm. The best way to describe it is we've got a combustion chamber that we can fill with pressure to actually throttle in that rocket around and conserve some of that energy. Um, so there, there is a ability to do certain things that other rockets can't do. If I need to destroy my rocket, I just tell the computer to set the internal controls in that combustion chamber to, to overload, uh, in, a in, in a sense. Uh, as we get higher and we get up, up towards orbit, we can put the rocket into a tumble, and the ceramics are only designed to last through burn. So really, once you burn it out, the rocket's almost compromised, um, depending on what size rocket it is and what its job is. So if you're going to LEO, as soon as you burn out, almost 30% of your, uh, the mass of the rocket is almost turned into gases in the combustion chamber. Uh, so we, well, the rocket gets lighter as we burn, right? And not just from the propellant, the, the structure of the rocket does too. And that allows us to tumble it into the atmosphere if need be. All right, thank you. Ramona? I want to ask you a little bit more about your composite and see if you uh, can share more about its composition and the like. Um, do you have issues with oxygen or hydrogen embrittlement and, and how does it respond to uh, radiation environment? So uh, the, they're, most of our commercial products are silica carbide, uh, pretty standard ceramic, nothing big. When we start getting the space hardware, we've got some complex uh, zirconium carbides and stuff like that, boron carbides that we use. Uh, and we can use them in different mixtures along with silica carbide. Um, specifically, zirconium carbide, which is a, a, a pretty big component of our rocket, uh, comes out of the nuclear industry and is very nuclear tolerant. Uh, so we can handle high temperature and also we can also handle um, what they call holes through the material. <laughs> I used to work in the nuclear industry and that was one of the reasons I knew about this ceramic. So those are the ones that, but most of our consumer products are all silica carbide, including our ballistic vests. So most plates are boron carbide. Most ballistic plates right now are boron carbide. So even we could, we could use it as, yeah, a, uh, a better ceramic mix. Uh, but we have a lot of various ceramics that we've used with it already. We just haven't released anything to the public yet on what on those side because it is ITAR limited. Mm. Okay, thank you. I'll look forward to chatting with you at the uh, impact table tomorrow. It should be a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it too. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, Brian. Um, uh, just wondering, what's the what are the you're 3D printing the ceramic? What's the what's the tolerances on that print process? How fine can you get it? Uh, we get down to about 0.1 millimeters, um, and that's with even substandard equipment. I would say that's not commercial grade equipment. So we can get we can get pretty high resolution, um, and then once we get a good model we can actually take it to a, a mass manufacturing and, and use it for in a uh, vacuum form molding or a uh, uh, injection molding process. Okay. So yeah, the printing process is a little bit, little bit more sloppy, 
But once we get a refined model, we can turn into a mass market where we can get high tolerances out of that. I got it. So you, you wouldn't normally, be, you'd only be 3D printing, 3D printing your test um, uh, phase, but then you'd go to um, molds. Correct. Correct. And uh, that, like for the motorcycle uh, heat shielding, okay, we could produce uh, hundreds of thousands at the, at the same time versus on the 3D printer, which would only, we'd only get 100 of them. So, so I have I have a need for a, something like this. It's not a rocket, but I have a need to make a reactor that is very uh, thermally tolerant, uh, but also uh, tolerant to high acidity. Uh, you know, sulfuric and ammonium sulfate. Um, is that something that you could make with this kind of ceramic? Uh, yeah, our ceramic, we we probably would like to do a different mixture than we have currently because of the uh, causticity. The, the acid, um, but the zirconium carbide is actually more stable than most forms that are out there already. Um, mainly because of the fact that we've, we've got our process to make it. Um, so the, the stability of ceramics, adding this plasticity to it really does give us a wide range and we are thermally isolation. So we saw that video plate of the of the burning fire, right? Well, that's about 2,000 degrees Celsius. The backside of the plate is still about 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, and we can build in cooling routes through that plate. Got it. Cool. Any other questions? Hi, Brian. It's Paul. Nice job, Brian. Can you please review again for us what your earlier reference was to your unique intellectual property? What is the portfolio and what categories are the end and how do they fit together for your strategy? All right, so the, the first one we secured was the positive structural molding. Um, and that's the process of turning uh, a bio-renewable plastics into a ceramic, right? And then we're looking at licensing, we're talking in talks to license that out to various um, markets, and that's where the prototypes are developed out of. Um, the next set of, of uh, prototype or intellectual property uh, deals mainly in location finding and the actual armoring up. So as we go into this rocket car or this mobile rocket uh, test stand, we're developing a new process to armor up cars and armor up those processes. And that will be the next set of patents is that being able to locate our, uh, this car as it's traveling down the track in high definition uh, using no GPS signals. Um, and then also the transfer of the energy from the rocket to the car. Thanks. Can you, can you, yeah, it does. You referred earlier to something that was unique IP relative to the CFD uh, processes within the rocket engine. Did I hear that correct? Do you have something unique correct. that you're patenting, or that you're protecting? Can you describe yeah. that again, please? So my PHBD is based upon the fluid dynamics that are going on inside the rocket, where most rockets, especially solid rockets, you gimbal the nozzle. We don't, we actually change the interior geometry of inside the combustion chamber and that allows us to actually control the rocket real easily. We don't need huge hydraulic systems. Um, it's a fairly small actuator that can control the rocket. Uh, any, and that, that leads into uh, a new way where I'm not willing to yet say, but we have a higher ISP than what is conventionally thought of as the max for a solid rocket engine. Um, and I, I'll say it's approaching liquid engine status. And that's why we've got a mobile test stand under development is we want to get real world data on exactly how efficient we are with solid rockets. Great. Thank you. Uh, great. Oh, can you say where you are on actually launching a payload to low Earth orbit? Do you have a customer or when do you expect to launch? So the customers that we're after are not in the industry and they're only concerned with capabilities. And these are big customers, pharmaceuticals, biotech. Um, and we refuse to sign any MOUs until we are ready to launch. So where we're at is uh, if we found the right partner, we could be six months 
to launch. Where we're at in this process, though, is the rocket car gets developed. We'll fire 20 or 30 of these rockets uh, using this Firebird. And then, and then we'll go from there and actually do a launch. So we're sitting right around two years, three years right there to launch a, a Carmen line attempt. And then our orbital attempt, if we continue to bootstrap, is set right about four years. And that would be, a, we're six years into a 10 year bootstrap project. And so one final question is the focus of your company is it to do the launch? Is it to do the cars or to do the motorcycles? Or is it really the composite? So we're looking at uh, sustainable space flight. And the rocket space flight is the actual goal. My daughter and I, I got a 14 year old boss. Um, she's got a 100 year plan. And it involves going to Saturn looking for life. Uh, she said that's the last stop before you leave the solar system. Jupiter's too big. <laughs> uh, but no, we're what we're doing is we're taking the technology that we develop and we're spinning it out uh, to the various industries that we can license this to. So that's residual income, uh, a, a check coming in every day or every month that I can spend on rockets and I don't have to do any work from. And that's kind of the business model. This is the East India Trading Company model. Uh, every time they sent they sent silk from India to Europe, they made X amount of dollars, right? Well, every time we commercialize, we get X amount of residuals. So I'm not interested in building ballistic plates, but I got to do it until we find the right manufacturer. We're talking to four of them right now, um, but we want to be able to hit the plate five or six times before we degrade the capabilities of the plate. That's where our goal is. So really, space flight's the goal. And uh, we've got a plan all the way out to a manned spacecraft going to Ju or going to Saturn. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, being able to. Um, uh, reduce the uh, brittleness of the ceramics. Uh, do you have uh, strength or durability trade-offs when you do that? Uh, sometimes. So you know, under the high heat conditions, depending on the structure of the, the underlying substrate, we do have some compromises there. Um, obviously, silica carbide is rated to about 1,700 degrees, and that propane's at 2,000. So most of the where we see is actually advantages. Um, unless we we mess it up when I, when I mess it when i mess up making the ceramic the plastic to ceramic it, we do see some degradation but uh no we don't usually see any uh any any degradation in that plus we 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 apply it in a certain process and that's part of our patent is how do we apply the ceramic to the um to the plastic All right, any follow-ups? Anybody else? All right, thank you very much, Max, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, I'm sure you will have uh, some exciting conversations in the impact tables tomorrow. Thanks for presenting. Uh, we're gonna move on now to uh, Sunil and NanoPrecise uh, Scientific Corporation. Welcome all, I'm Sunil, founder and CEO of NanoPrecise. Prior to founding NanoPrecise, I had 10 years of experience as a mechanical engineer with EPC companies such as Worley Parsons, mainly in oil and gas. While working at a plant site one day, I witnessed a near miss event on the site due to a rotating equipment failure. Luckily, no one was injured, but it caused a massive downtime that cost company millions in lost production. Let me show you what can happen due to a rotating equipment failure. In steel rolling mill, steel is shaped for various industrial applications such as railways. The steel passes through the rollers to gradually reduce outside diameter. However, when the rollers of this conveyor on which the steel is rolling fails, the steel is unable to pass and jams up one after the other. You can see how a worker just got saved from a near fatal event. 
all of us relate to wind turbine as a clean form of energy that should not be hazardous in any way. The brakes, which are important to control turbine speed during high winds when faint causes a catastrophic failure. Both of these events can be detected in advance and can be entirely avoided. As per McKinsey, unplanned downtimes cost global economy around $100 billion per annum. There are many approaches that are being tried in the market to unlock this massive value. For example, using AI models on process parameters such as pressure, temperature, and flow rate to predict failures. Monitoring based on SCADA data does not mean one will have insights on equipment health. It seemed like me expecting my doctor to tell me what ailment do I have based on what I have consumed in the past, how much I exercise and how many calories I lost rather than my blood pressure or the heart rate. But unfortunately, these practices and this philosophy is still rampant in the industry. This is actually the reason why Cisco study says that as much as 75% of the predictive maintenance projects fail due to poor quality data, limited data, inaccurate feature correlation. This in effect leads to relation between user and the PDM vendor to be stuck in pilot purgatory and leads to delayed full-scale implementation. To solve these issues plaguing predictive maintenance, we at NanoPrecise have brought a unique solution that comprises of machine doctor, an IoT-based sensor, and AI-powered software platform called Rotation Life. Our sensor feels vibration, listens to the machine sound, measures its temperature, speed in RPM, humidity of the environment, and magnetic field near motor, all with one sensor. That's why it is truly a machine doctor. When it comes to vibration and magnetic flux, our sensor is literally as accurate as a handheld analyzer, which is almost 100 times more expensive than our sensor. And this is not our statement. One can simply check with some of our users who had rigorously tested our sensor against a handheld analyzer. It can measure RPM with more than 99.9% .9 accuracy, proven. It has all the required certifications, including compliance with IEC EX Zone 0. That means it is applicable for any industry in any hazardous area, regardless. First, we collect equipment data from customer. Once the data from these sensing elements goes to the cloud, sensor data is correlated with the equipment data to achieve three basic objectives of predictive maintenance, anomaly detection, fault mode de determination, and remaining time to failure prediction in a completely automated way. For achieving true prescriptive maintenance, the automated root cause analysis is needed for which we need customers process data from their DCS, PLC and SCADA. We have partnered with open automation software for achieving this and irrespective of any kind of DCS, PLC or SCADA that the user has, we can easily integrate data from any silo into our cloud and send our cloud data to anywhere. Our whole data pipeline complies with cybersecurity standards such as UL 2900-2-2 and AES 256 level encryption. The results of the analysis are available on a dashboard that is accessible through mobile, whether iOS or Android, and the user is notified through text or emails. We differentiate from many other vendors because of our superior notification strategy, which keeps our notifications to an exceptionally low rate per sensor without missing out any important messages. So how is Machine Doctor unique? This is how our sensor sounds for electrical line frequency problem in a motor. Using acoustic, our users can intuitively feel from their seat that there is something wrong from the sound itself. With the magnetic flux feature, we can detect more mechanical and electrical faults accurately. Unlike other IoT-based surface-mounted sensors that are mainly suitable for anti-friction bearings, due to our acoustic ca emission capability of 80 kHz sampling rate, ours is also good for production-critical journal bearing machines, apart from anti-friction bearing machines. So what is special about our software? It's our approach, patent pending algorithms, and the domain expertise that filters fault positives with such high accuracy that in the last six months, we detected and notified close to 50 faults and none of them have been proven wrong. So how do we do this? Firstly, we use AE and temperature to detect any anomalous behavior within the machine. To understand whether this anomalous behavior is due to process upset or due to an actual fault, we process the raw data with most advanced signal processing algorithm in academic world named SIEMDAM to filter the overall vibration signal into individual components of the same. To put this into perspective, the SIEMDAM algorithm works like this. If a room full of people are talking and if the crowd's noise is recording with a microphone and when SIEMDAM is applied on the signal, it decomposes the signal into multiple smaller signals where each specific signal will contain the voice of the individual person. 
Now, to diagnose the faults in the machine, we correlate the extracted speed with the high, re high resolution vibration data from the seam dam to calculate the excitation frequencies of multiple rotating components inside the machine at that particular speed. Following this, we predict the remaining time to failure of each component and highlight the one with the least time to failure as the predominating fault mode. Finally, to confirm our finding, we correlate this with the reading from our online infrared temperature before alerting. Because of these differentiating aspects of our solution, one of our customers is installing up to 2000 of our sensors in a single plant. Based on such demand and based on the number of critical monitorable rotating machines available in the world, we anticipate a global addressable market size of $15.6 billion and we are mainly focused on North America and Asia Pacific. Earlier this year, in April, during COVID time, we achieved $720,000 in potential unplanned downtime savings by avoiding a failure on the gearbox for our mining and metals customer. All this for a monthly fee of $3,300 only. Nutrien, our customer, was so happy that they have consistently added reasonable quantity of sensors every month since then, with the latest PO coming as latest as today. According to our customers, our solution acts like a cost insure effective insurance policy for capital assets. We also see uh, foresee multiple use cases for our technology at NASA, such as HVAC facilities in NASA uh, or NASA's wind turbines. It can also be used in some unique upcoming applications such as Urban Air Taxi that is being tested with Uber and NASA participation. For using it on board a spacecraft, we will use a different microprocessor to do most of the calculations on the edge. So how do we fare with the rest of the competition? As we compare ourselves with both startup and well-established players in the same field, we are the only one providing 6-in-1 sensor in the world. We have the highest vibration frequency bandwidth within MEMP sensors. We can do RPM detection from the range of 10 to 6,000 RPM with more than 99% accuracy. We are the only company that is doing vibration to RPM correlation up to a single second accuracy. When it comes to fault diagnosis using AI, EMD plus WNN method has been rated to be the most accurate and fastest converging method when compared to other well-known neural network methods. There's ample evidence on this and also a book published on this. We are one of the first company to commercialize this EMD plus WN combination for rotating equipment. As per Chevron study, annual savings of $2,500 in motor maintenance costs can be achieved due to truly predictive maintenance. Our value for money is such that our solution is viable for a machine as small as 20 horsepower. In the future, to keep our competitive advantage, we are launching products both in sensor and software area. In the sensor area, we are launching energy harvesting version of our sensor very soon in coordination with our strategic partner. On the software side, we are working on launching our process optimization module to increase the yield throughput to provide the next level of significant value to our customers. Our go-to-market strategy is such that end users such as process plants are our top priority to whom we reach out either directly or to distributors, depending on the location. Based on success with case study about a specific equipment, we reach out to those equipment OEMs. Finally, most of the system integrators such as SAP, IBM, or CMMS vendors that have all the enterprise and financial data would like to utilize our insights to convert into dollars uh, th that can be realized with predictive maintenance in real time. Through this go-to-market strategy, we have been able to penetrate end users, of end users in five major sectors, oil and gas, mining and metals, fertilizer, pharma, and mobility. With a total of 15 plus paid customers and three times as many customers in pipeline, we are looking forward to an explosive growth. We have distributors in every continent now and in some regions have multiple of them. This really helps us to scale quickly without having a physical office in that location. This also makes us highly diversified. As long as 50% of our sales now is due to distributors. Thus, we put a lot of efforts in training our distributors. Since we raised our pre-seed round in November 2017, we raised $3.6 million so far and are a strong team of 31 spread across two continents. In total, we have 2,000 plus paid sensor licenses with an enviable 95% conversion ratio from pilot to commercial contract. Our current monthly recurring revenue is $80,000 per month. The average contract size awarded by our users is $70,000 per annum and a minimum contract duration is one year, excluding the pilot phase, of course. We achieved close to $1 million multi-year contract with a single customer in Jan 2020, probably 
one of the largest PDM automation program of its kind till date. The lifetime value from our customers on an average is $1.4 million. We have seen a significant jump in our contracts during the COVID phase, and we are hoping to close the sales of 4,200 sensor licenses by the end of this year, or at max within first quarter of next year. By the end of 2023, we hope to have 60,000 active sensor licenses generating $20 million in recurring revenue. The success so far has been possible due to our diverse team. Graham Kavulka, who is our VP of BD, work, worked for both large companies such as GE and Siemens and for startups. Surekha, with her 10 years of experience as an HR professional with startups at different stages, is building a unique culture that is rich in values and principle. Prashant is our CTO who had his own uh, AI-based startup for seven years. Farad is the head of software and worked under world-famous AI professor Richard Sutton. Arun, our hardware and firmware lead, has worked with customers like Apple and Teradyne. Our board is composed of well-known experts in their fields and is led by Brian Craig, who is one of the most successful uh, and influential investor in the Canadian startup ecosystem. He recently sold his company Solium Capital to Morgan Stanley for $1 billion. Our technical advisory team is composed of a group of five close-knit professors that work together in the field of advanced condition monitoring and have hundreds of technical papers and books published under their name. NanoPrecise was founded by me in 2000, April 2017. By November 2017, I raised $1 million in capital. By December 2018, we had all the certifications for our product with four case studies and some commercial customer. In May 2019, we raised $1 million more. And in between, we also won $400,000 in government grants. In February 2020, we signed an MSA agreement and a PO close to $1 million from Fortune 500 steel company. By now, we reached to 25 people and we raised another $1 million on a convertible debt in March 2020. We are on track to have $1.8 million in ARR with more than 25 paid clients and strong team of 35 people in Jan 2021. Our solution is now completely developed and commercially scalable whether the user wants to buy with or without our sensor. Thus, this is the time to scale it rapidly while keeping our churn to less than 5% annually. In this pursuit, we are raising $4 million for our Series A round, out of which we aim to spend more than 50% on business development and the rest on customer support, distributor training, new features development, and new product launches. Thank you. Thank you. Let's open it up for questions. Uh, Ramona. All right, uh, Cheryl, let's go to you. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about HVAC? Um, I have a background in a lot of commercial real estate stuff, which BMS is and all that, but I'm also interested about, you know, more serious uses like data centers. Are those spaces worth exploring for you? Or is your price point and technology kind of too high to want to be servicing those things? Uh, no, actually, our price point is uh, very well suited for even those applications. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it varies from uh, $40 per sensor per month to something like $20 per sensor per month. So uh, it's completely, I think uh, HVAC is a very great application. We were talking to one, uh, you know, Edmonton-based company called Silent Air, uh, who does, uh, you know, data centers, provide HVAC for the data centers. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, definitely that that is a possible usage. Thank you. Hey, I'm on now. Um, <laughs> a little delay there. Now, uh, I mean, you can do far more than HVAC, right? I mean, yes. we have an interest with our uh, <laughs> gas pump facility um, for our rocket engine testing. And uh, so you have some other experiences with that, or, or at least that would be an area we'd want to look at. I guess I'll talk about that more with you at the impact table. But could you discuss some other uses that you have some experience or, or extrapolations of how you could use this for NASA? 
Sure, yeah. So we are, for example, uh, for one customer uh, called Delec, uh, who, which has a refineries in Houston. So we are monitoring a lot of pumps. Uh, those are uh, like uh, fluid pumps and natural gas pumps and uh, a very uh, hazardous area and uh, high temperature uh, pumps. So, uh, I mean, we, are, we have detected faults like uh, cavitation or like uh, impeller uh, damage or, you know, bearing damage. Uh, shaft misalignment, unbalanced looseness. So I, I definitely don't see any problem in managing, uh, monitoring those uh, for NASA, the gas pumps. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Sherman? Did you call? Yes. Um, I wanted to understand what is the average number of sensors? You said it's $40 per sensor per month. What's the average number of sensors that you deploy? Um, at this time? Yeah, so there are two types of equipments in the world. One is anti-friction bearing, other is journal bearings. So anti-friction bearings, the simple formula is one sensor per bearing. So if you have a motor and a pump, usually there'll be four sensors, right? Um, and uh, if it is an anti-friction bearing, uh, then basically, uh, depending on the horsepower size, for example, for a 4,000 horsepower reciprocating compressor uh, at uh, one oil and gas company, we had uh, seven, seven sensors uh, per reciprocating compressors so uh, so that's that's the number yeah and, and i just want to check those sensors are pretty much commoditized hardware sensors right um yes okay got it so you don't make those or anything like that that's commoditized i mean we we uh like a contract manufacturer the design is all done so we just uh, give an order. So within 20 days, we will have some, you know, up to 10,000 sensors ready. Got it. Okay. And how long does it, how long on average with the customers you have thus far, does it take you to deploy your sensors um, on someone's equipment? Yeah, good question. So, uh, for example, like uh, we uh, like uh, just, uh, you know, uh, 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 just last week we installed, uh, last month we installed uh, like a 200 sensors for uh, at one refinery so it take just 2 days so uh, i would say, i would say that uh, you know 100 sensors or 150 sensors per day is easily doable got it and what's the replacement time like how long do those sensors typically last and when do you subsequently need to replace them yeah, so the sensor is made of very durable, like uh, a steel and, uh, you know, uh, the plastic material. Uh, so sensor life itself will go on. I mean, uh, unless and until it's a highly acidic environment, uh, it should also stay in that. But, but apart from that, the battery life, uh, we are looking at, I mean, we have optimized our battery life to anywhere from 1.5 years all the way up to, uh, you know, seven, uh, five years or more, uh, depending on the, 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 uh, the upload rate. Right. But at the same time, our sensor is smart enough that, uh, you know, it is taking the data uh, every 10 minutes and it is doing a lot of uh, edge computing. So in that way, it is smart that when it detects anything, then only it will upload to Internet. And if it has uplo uploaded to Internet already a certain number of times uh, and, and detected a problem, so it will stay silent for that day. So in that way, because if we have the basic assumption is for, for a day, if we have detected one problem, you, we don't need to repeat uh, notifying the same problem again and again for that pump. Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you. All right, Harry. So, can you tell how big are the sensors? And when you hook a sensor up to an instrument or... Okay, how yep. um, how much data, how, or what do you have to tell it about what you're hooking it up to in order for you to diagnose it and do the prognosis? Yeah, so uh, that that's one of the good part. We don't need any data from the customer except uh, basic things like. Uh, you know, uh, like a bearing number or the, you know, basic nominal RPM, even though we detect RPM ourselves, but we, we just want to know the nominal RPM. So, uh, and, and the gear ratios and all that. So once, so these things are very readily available. Customer can give for hundred equipments within a day. So once we have that, we will, uh, you know, configure all the characteristic frequencies and, um, you know, and, and then uh, we, we basically uh, start getting the data. There is a two weeks training time. And after the training time, uh, it will start, you know, detecting, uh, doing those three objectives, anomaly detection, 
fault mode determination and the remaining time to failure prediction based on how each and every fault is, uh, you know, show, uh, trending in its severity. Are you collecting sound as well as vibration or is it just vibration? We are collecting sound and vibration. This is Ramona again. Um, you are located in Canada, correct? Yes. Do you have um, an office in the U.S. that uh, the U.S. government could work through? Yeah, so we we basically are establishing our office in U.S. And we also have identified one partner uh, who is a level four vibration, a certified vibration engineer. So he's ready to join us as soon as uh, early next year. Uh, so, uh, so let's say early next year we will have uh, the office and set up and uh, our very uh, uh, skillful and experienced engineer who can uh, help you and uh, who already worked with uh, Lawrence Center at NASA. So he can very well uh, service your needs. Yeah. Thank you. Paul. Thanks. Nice job, Sunil. Earlier in your briefing, you described three types of partnerships that you are creating three venues to get to the market. Can you tell us who inside your organization is developing those partnerships and what's your what's your specific process to approach them and build them out that leads to your strategy to get to market? Sure, yeah, I have my VP of business development here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I have my VP of business development, Graham Kavulka. Uh, he's already bringing some partnerships. Uh, so, Graham, would you like to talk about this? Sure, yeah. Uh, good question, Paul. Uh, so, this, the strategy, uh, as, as Sunil mentioned, has a couple of components. The primary ones is uh, going after end users who have the real uh, pain or interest in value creation, and also working with distributors. So. Uh, the distributors we're working with, uh, we go through an evaluation of who are they, are they uh, credible, and uh, what kind of relationships do they have to potential end users. A lot of the distributors we, we work with uh, end up being people who are already very technically talented and have a background in condition monitoring, and they already have a client base, and they know how to evaluate uh, our technology uh, and our offering and the differenti differentiation points Sunil mentioned so that they can go, hey, this is different than what I've seen in the past. And most of the time when we're talking to people who are knowledgeable, they really get what the value and the difference is. So they can sort of sort the wheat from the chaff, if that makes sense. So once you have that relationship established, they already know the details of what condition monitoring is. They just need to have some trust that we're doing things that they can, their reputation with their clientele and uh, connections will uh, not put them in a tough spot. So that, that's, I think, what we spend most of our time on with distributors is making sure that they are comfortable and that they believe and that we can show them that there's a difference here. On the end users, we talk about uh, all kinds of things related to financial, really. Uh, you know, the tech is interesting and we have to get over that hurdle with them. But then we start talking about business case, and that all comes back to references, referrals, case studies, uh, as well as, you know, talking about health and safety and access uh, and that kind of stuff. So we spend most of our time talking about uh, the tech from a credibility point of view, differentiation, as well as the financial. Okay, Graham, thank you. I have one quick follow up then. Are you specific? Tell us about how you are specifically working with any of the existing U.S. advanced manufacturing consortium and working groups that are already venues to distributors and already venues to markets or any of the university based smart factory programs that are being built out. Uh, I'm Sunil, maybe you want to help with that one because I'm actually not aware of any connections we have to those particular um, ones. I think, Paul, I might need to know the specifics of like institutions and we can maybe comment more. But Sunil, are you familiar with any of what Paul's asking? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, like uh, at least till now, Paul, we, we don't have uh, any association, but we 
uh, that's that's the whole intent of attending all these uh, events uh, like NASA, ITEC, and all that because we want uh, exposure to uh, U.S. market and those uh, smart manufacturing uh, groups that you talked about. We have uh, some in in Canada. We are associated with some associations in Canada, like uh, I think uh, uh, pro, m m a mining association that we have, Graham, as you know. So, uh, but but we want exposure to those organizations. Those associations in US. Okay, thank you for the answer. All right, do we have any other questions? All right, well, Max, back to you. Thank you, Sunil. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, great work, and again, looking forward to, to some uh, in-depth discussions tomorrow from the whole panel, or uh, from the at the impact tables from the individual members of the panel, uh, as well as uh, other impact uh, table participants. Uh, that brings us to our uh, afternoon break. Uh, it's a short one, so we will see everybody back here at 3:25, uh, and uh, at that time, we'll be uh, looking here from Orbit's Edge. Thank you. Thank you.